Good morning, everyone. Thank you, first and foremost, for joining the World After Sport Sporting Transitions. Um, I thought I'd just do an intro to, to say hello first. We've got 11 or 12 of us on the call so far. Um, hopefully a couple more will join and um, we'll kick off. But let me first introduce who's on the call and then I'm going to pass over to Phil Davis to provide some information um, and uh, we'll, we can crack on with the session. So on the call so far, we've got Adam Jones from Quinns. We've got Phil from, um, from Leeds Rugby, Andrew Coombs, Alan Davies, Dylan Rick Parsons down under, Sean Long, Andre Snowman, um, Carl Hogg, Tim Stimson and Johan LaRue and finally Charles. Charlie McCrone. So thank you all for joining. Um, really appreciate it. And let me pass to Phil. Um, and I'm going to help one of our struggling attendees just get in if that's all right. So uh, Phil, if I may just pass over to you. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And again, just echo Martin's thoughts, thanking you know, everyone for making uh, the time to come on. There's a few who've been on before made valuable contributions. And you know, I'm really excited to you know, to, to listen to some of the experiences and, and knowledge that uh, that the, some of the other guys have got, like Adam, you know, Jones, new into coaching, Sean Long going from rugby league to rugby union. Uh, so really excited about, you know, uh, hearing your journeys and your transitional pieces. As with Andrew Coombs as well, Andrew going from playing into business, you know, and retaining a link with the game through his commentary and punditry. So, you know, I think we've got some really good uh, guys on today with some great experiences. So... Just a little bit of background of how I sort of spoke to Martin and Tim about World After Sport. You know, I looked, saw it on, uh, I think you saw it on social media, started having a chat with Martin. And what I liked about the initial things that I was reading and seeing and discussing was supporting the players, basically. Uh, and that's always, you know, been important for me, whether I was playing as a captain or, 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 or since retiring. Uh, you know, coaching. But then I started thinking about coaches. What what sort of support is there out there for coaches? Um, it's okay when you got a job. It's great. And it's okay when you're going through your formal coaching education, doing your badges with the RFU, WRU, Scottish Rugby Union, South African Rugby Union, whatever it might be. That's pretty straightforward. But what happens after that in continuous professional development for coaches? Again, it's easy enough when you're in a job. But when you're not in a job, but when you're transitioning between jobs, what type of support is there? And that's an area Martin and, 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 and I have chatted uh, about and Tim to see if we can support, hence, these type of webinars that we're trying to, trying to build, trying to, you know, trying to add experience and knowledge, you know, like we're going to do today. Uh, so what I, what I thought I'd do is we, we themed this particular webinar in, in respects of building high-performing teams to be competition-ready, uh, and I'll just share, you know, one slide for context, not to impress anybody, for just a bit of context of, of where my journey's taken me over the last 25 years as a coach. And also just a clear why, what, how we've, you know, we've used over the years in terms of how we build sort of, as I say, high-performing teams who are competition ready. There'll be a few examples from my Namibia days, which, which Johan was very helpful uh, when he was commentating and giving me intelligence on some of the other Africa teams who were uh, qualify or trying to qualify for the World Cup at the same time as us. So, if uh, I'll just go through the slides. There's only five uh, as, a, as a few anecdotes within them, and then we can perhaps discuss and, and, and other people can share their experience and knowledge. There's no rocket science, as I say, but it just gives you a flavour of, of, of the journey uh, and the experiences I've been you know, lucky to go on, really. Um, so, if you bear with me. I'll just try and share, share my screen. Right. There's a few of these boys I've been lucky enough to share this journey with. Uh, Tim being one of them. But it's just, it's just, that's, you know, my journey really over the last so many years has been has been amazing, really. The, the big thing that I've really enjoyed is playing and coaching in over 20-odd countries, I think. Uh, particularly the last five years, you know, being in Namibia through a World Rugby consultancy. And that's been amazing. Uh, you know, I've been at Worcester, so I've coached in the English game. I've been very lucky to do that. Coaching in the Welsh game and obviously coached in, you know, in the Africa Cup, Nations Cup and the last two World Cups. Uh, and also went over to France as well to coach uh, with Richard Hill as an assistant coach as well. So, 
it's been an amazing journey. Uh, and you know, I suppose that just gives a little bit of context of of what's been going on with me over the last few years, albeit very brief. Uh, but it's been an amazing journey, which is which you know I'm very lucky that it's that it's that it's continuing. Um, when we're looking at the process of building high-performing teams, what, this is what I've learned really. You know, it's important to make sure that the the team is competition ready. I know that sounds obvious, uh, but you know, when I first went to Namibia, you know, they said to me, uh, you know, I said, "What's your ambition?" And they said, "Oh, we uh, we want to win the first game in the 2015 World Cup." So I was quite pleased that they had a bit of ambition. But then I said, who's, who's the opponents? And I said, they told me the All Blacks. I said, well, right, OK. Well, that's a, a little bit unrealistic for Namibia, a part-time team to try and beat the All Blacks. So that's when we started looking at the idea of being competition ready. So we came up with a term, uh, Tier 1 Test Match Ready. Uh, and we looked at the statistics uh, or what that meant, which was, say, 40 minutes ball in play, for example. And then maybe in club game was about 26 minutes ball in play at that time. So we basically, along the four years, we went, we went about closing the gap uh, between 26 minutes and, and 40 minutes. And you, you'll all understand, hopefully, what I mean by that. Uh, and this is, you know, the way that we've sort of have learned to do it. Um, I have a clear why. So, you know, it's, it's something that people, why people get out of bed in the morning, you know, and it's got to represent, inspire and excite the people. Uh, and again, I don't think I'm talking any rocket science here, but, you know, representing the key stakeholders, in Namibia's case, it's the country. You know, in Leeds' case, it's, it's, it's the city of Leeds, it's Yorkshire. In the Scarlet's case, it's the, it's the town of Llanelli, for example. You know, and then having an aspiring pathway so people can see how they can get from, from A to B, basically. And then, you know, the inspiration and the excitement comes from, you know, getting, getting a clear purpose and a unified purpose in order to get people, you know, out of bed in the morning or, or want to come to games to, you know, to watch. And one of the big things for us at Leeds back in the day, as some of the boys on the call will remember, with the family support was very important. I think one of the best things we ever did was create a crash on match days back years and years ago. And that was a really popular thing with the wives for obvious reasons. And it really engaged uh, or was one of the things we did with the families, amongst other things we did without the families. As Snaes will know, uh, that was that was good fun. So for me, it's important to have a clear why, a purpose of 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 why you're putting this team together and what you're trying to achieve. Um, the what of it for me, this is just my coaching philosophy, if you like. Um, it's it's about being people centred. You know, it's got to be a collaborative approach, even more so nowadays. Uh, you can call it development driven, but you know, I like to call it growth mindset. So making sure that yourself, your coaches, your players, you know, are open-minded and curious about learning, about the game, about themselves, about others. And then the competition supported, really, I mean, values, real value, substance in what you're doing and getting straight to the core issues. So what I mean by that is, is the behaviour. So you can have, yeah, our values are honesty, uh, they're pride, uh, they're, whatever the words are. They don't mean an awful lot unless unless you get them, um, uh, you know, unless you get those behaviours each and every day. And then you get into the core issues most of the time in terms of player management or the game itself. There's no bullshit going around it. So that's that's a philosophy that, that we've sort of grown over the last um, uh, 25 years, if you like, but particularly the last five years, uh, particularly out in Africa, because you haven't really got the... Uh, the resources that you would have in a tier one country. So that's very important in terms of being, you know, can be creative and try and make more of less basically. So that's the, the, the what of, of what we're doing. Uh, and then oh, I haven't put these in order, boys, I apologize. But that's the five steps that, that I'd look at when we're building is making sure we have a club first mentality or team first mentality. We've all heard the saying, playing for the name on the front of the shirt, not the back of the shirt. You know, the recruitment and retention is important. Not necessarily always getting the best people, but getting the right people. That's, that's very important, obviously. And then the culture and the partnerships that you grow within, within, within the team, whether it's linking with universities, um, you know, so you get sports science research, for example, 
uh, or like in Namibia, we d we linked to the Welsh Rugby Union on performance analysis. So we had a lot of Welsh guys coming out over the period of the four years to help us on performance analysis. And what we were giving back to them was obviously the opportunity to go, you know, to the biggest rugby competition in the world, basically. Uh, you know, and then the culture is important, getting getting the right people, getting the right behaviours, but also getting an understanding of what high performance means. I mean, what I mean by that is in, in Namibia, their view of high performance was a little bit different to, to our view of high performance. We are coming from a tier one mindset and they, they are coming from a very much, which is a global mindset, but they were coming from very much a local mindset and their level of high performance was, was, was not the same as ours or their thought of high performance. So you've got to understand the context of the culture that you're operating in. That's very important. Coaching, planning and resource, again, that's, that's vital. Everybody talks about weekly or tactical periodization. Now, Eddie Jones does a lot. Um, you know, and we use weekly tactical periodization. I think everybody knows the learning days, the intensity days, the transitions, the speed days, the game rehearsal, all that type of stuff uh, is, is important. And as the week progresses, it's more and more important that the players take over towards the end of the week. Our, our Thursday sessions leading into test matches would always be the players having um, you know, a clarity session in front of the players and coaches in order to articulate the game plan or the themes for the game that we put in place during the course of the week. So there's a bit of panic on some coaches' faces, but the more and more we got into it, the more and more, the, 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 the more, and more benefits we come out to it. Uh, and finally, the fifth point is competition analysis. As I said, uh, understanding the, the, the realities of, and, and the levels of performance that you're going into. Um, so that's, that's, our, that's my clear, you know, sort of why, what, how. And ultimately, you know, for me, I've got leads in here as an example. So we're trying to rebuild that at the moment. But it's providing a culture where, where people get those four things. They feel valued, they have a sense of belonging. There's, there's, there's a level of safety and control for them, particularly players in terms of knowing where their contracts are, knowing the situation is, 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 is consistent uh, and is trying to get the best out of, out, out of everyone who's involved, who's involved in the club. So that's, that's a quick snapshot, Martin, gents, on, on how you know, we've I've summarised, if you like, on how, I, how I'm now trying to build teams on whatever level you are. Uh, I suppose the higher up you go, it's a little bit easier because you've got, you've got amazing uh, intellectual property with the players nowadays. I think it's a case of providing frameworks for them uh, and trying to keep order in the place so that those guys can, can express themselves. You know, when, like Andre and I talked about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago when he came to Leeds, I was going to try and coach him because he's a world-class rugby player. I just wanted to make sure he could express himself or put, you know, create an environment where these top players can perform. Uh, and he did, and, and, and you know, many others did. But the lower, the lower you go down, the more intellectual property I think you've got to, you've got to put in at the start. Uh, you know, and, and there is a bit of, um, there is, you know, there is a bit of autocratic coaching. But then you've got to try and move that into more, of a, more democratic type coaching and involve players as they develop. So there's, there's different approaches depending on the levels that you're, that you're coaching at. Um, and that's it from me, really. Any questions? We can, we can, we can, we can obviously chat. Uh, hopefully, there's something there that makes makes a bit of sense. And there's a process on on, on how to grow grow a team. But maybe I'd, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, Matt, is I'd like to maybe bring Sean Long in, Sean, and just maybe discuss how you found the transition between you know coaching and, and, and playing in rugby league and coaching in in, in rugby union, if that's all right, Matt. Uh, yes, yeah, so, hi guys. Um, yeah, rugby league. Obviously, I, I played to, from being seven years of age, so it just come natural to me. Uh, found the transition quite easily to, to professional. Uh, unfortunately for me, I, I finished my career with an injury. But luckily, on the flip side, there was a job waiting for me straight away at Salford. So I jumped at the chance and went straight in from playing to coaching. I found that quite difficult, if I'm being honest, for the first 12 months because I thought I was still a player and acting like, you know, a player as it was. Um, 
but then after 12 months, then I realised, like, I'm not your teammate, I'm your coach here. And I'm getting the two confused. Um, and then I coached professionally, you know, with St. Helens and Salford and Wigan uh, for eight years uh, in league. And, and I was just getting stale. Uh, and I, I played union at a lower level for a couple of years at Preston Grasshoppers, which was, wasn't the greatest standard ever. But, you know, I, I, I had a, a good idea of what was going on. Uh, but for me, it was just a new challenge, as in to go to Union. I've always admired the sport and always watched it, and, and just just to have a crack at it, really. Um, when I first went down in June last year, um, in pre-season, it was it was a massive shock to me, like the amount of detail what went into everything. You know, whether it's a line out, it's a scrummaging breakdown. Uh, what players you could put on because I'm thinking you can put any play on what you're doing rugby league uh, but then obviously the most vital part of the game is breakdown you know if you lose the ball then we're screwed so for me I was it, and I'm still learning now you know it's like it's been nearly 12 months now and I'm I'm still learning now and that's why I'm doing all these uh, webinars and, and to speaking to other coaches, speaking to Bob and Toby Booth and Guzzi and Eddie Jones and just speaking to them all about how I can improve as a coach. But I just found it, at first, my job when I first went in at uh, Quinn's was, if you're going to run a play, then tell us how to run it left better. So if you want to run this play, then, then that was my job basically, to run this play better than anyone in the comp. But as progress as it progressed, I've started to understand the game a little bit better. So I'm started coming up with new more ideas. Why can we not do this? Why can we not do that? Sometimes I get caught what a little bit, which frustrates me. Um, and and I'm like, uh, but then obviously with the furlough and I'm on the coronavirus happening now, uh, we've had some time to rethink as a group and as a group of staff. I've had some time to think about, you know, ideas, what I was trying to bring in at the start, whether they will work. Because probably when you're thinking about it, a rugby league guy coming into rugby union, coming up with these ideas, they're going to just go, nah, nah, piss off, mate. So I was a, I was a bit frustrated, but, you know what I mean? Um, but now, obviously, with what's going on, we're starting to bring some stuff in, some new ideas. Uh, and and it, it's... I feel more involved now. At first, I felt like an outsider, and I felt like I was just like, just, just like, just say uh, Nick Evans wanted to run a play. Then I, I'd tell him where to stand, how wide to catch it, which defenders to get to, you know, uh, you know how deep you need to be, and just stuff like that. But now I'm progressing as a coach, and uh, I am getting better, but I'm still way off. And that's why, you know, it's going to take me a while. I'm not saying I've mastered it yet, but it's, it's going to take me another couple of years before I know the ins and outs of it because it's so technical. Sure. Longer you'll have to play a few, more, um, a few more games for the um, for Rugby for Euros, mate. We'll sort your rugby union skills out. <laughs> mate, I dislocated my shoulder in that game. I'm flipping, split my eye. I can't believe it when I play for the, uh, when I play for you, Gloucester guys. Mate, if you want to play with the big boys, mate, you've got to be able to pack it up, mate. I know. I wasn't ready. <laughs> Used to smaller books. <laughs> Positional sense. Go to the small guys. Can I just take you back a bit, Sean, to the um, the comment you made earlier about when you felt like you were still a player, but tran that transition bit. How did you... What What was that moment where you went, oh, hang on a minute, I'm not one of the lads anymore? And and how tough was that? Yeah, yeah. Because when you, when you come from a player and, and you win as a coach, I felt like to get them on side, I felt like I had to be the mate. And I was like, and you know, hanging around with them, you know what I mean. And then, you know, I have had the crack with them at lunch and stuff like that. You know, the coaching staff was sat there. I still be kind of sat with the players, and I'm like, uh, and then. Then they'd be ringing me up saying, do you fancy going out for a beer? And then I'd go, yeah, yeah, I'll go out for a beer. Yeah. And then, then it clicked and I thought, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not your mate. I'm, I'm your coach. And uh, like I say, it, it took, took a while. It took about 12 months. But some, something just clicked in my head and I thought, they'll probably respect me more if, 
if I become a coach rather than, you know, like, like a father figure rather than a brother or a mate. So something clicked in my head. And then, and then all of a sudden, then, then, then yeah, I felt, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what the word is, but it just, it just, just clicked. And then I become like a better moment. Really. Yeah, it's just a moment in me, what happened. And then I started becoming a better coach then because I started segregating myself from the players. I could think more. They wasn't giving me advice what I we should play. You know, I had my own ideas. Uh, and, and still now, you, you always want to be liked as a coach. But for me, now I'm not really asked. It's, you know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, I'm doing a job. I'm doing a job for up the team. I'm doing a job for the club, the fans, and also really just to uh, just to improve the team and improve the players to, to succeed, really. And that's that's how I approach it now. If they like me, they like me. If they don't, they don't. But, you know, I'm, I'm a decent person, if I'm honest. And, and most of them, well, I hope they, I hope they like me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I guess for me, I totally agree with what you're saying there, Sean, is um, it's not necessarily about being liked, it's about being respected. That's the, that's um, the word I was looking for. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, did you want to jump in? And then I'm, Adam, I'm going to come to you after Phil, if I may. Yeah, just, just a quick one, Sean. I said, you know, I some great points there. What I liked about it is, you know, one of the points I got, you know, four key messages, one of them is become a student of the game, which is what you're trying to do, obviously, in that. You know, we've all heard the word Kaizen, that continuous improvement. It's important to speak. Like, we are chatting here. Like, you've mentioned all the guys that you're speaking to as coaches. I think that's fantastic because the game moves on so quickly, as we all know. Uh, and as you say, you're learning. You know, I think, you know, it's amazing the level you've got in that and the effect you already had. Uh, you know, and with that type of attitude, you get better and better and better. There's no doubt about it. I mean, so I think, you know, that's a fantastic uh, approach uh, to have. And... You know, I just want to continue with, you know, so nice one. Thank you, Phil. So, so, Adam, obviously you've not long finished the playing days as well, probably about two years, I think, now, is it? Something like that? Yeah, just about, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably a bit longer if you actually saw me in the pitch, but, yeah. Yeah, I did mean officially. <laughs> so what's your thoughts of the transition? Because, again, you've gone into coaching, doing a great job at Quinn's. Um, and obviously, again, that mate's transition versus... I'll call it fatherhood figure that Sean said, which I think is absolutely right. But the respect changes, the thoughts change towards you. Um, well, I, I was lucky enough to, well, I guess lucky enough to have a chance to go and play in the Queens with uh, Con O'Shea and um, John Kingston with, with a separate sort of job to mentor, if you want, some of the props we had. So we got, obviously, when I was going there, we had Sinclair who was a young kid. Will Collier was a young kid, and then you had Joe Marlowe's I played against, but still, as we know, Joe could be a bit, you know, he's a bit different. So, you know, Connor wanted to, um, Connor wanted me to sort of uh, mentor them, and um, that was a massive deal. No, it was a draw to me. You know, I was kind of, I kind of see it was coming towards the end of my career. I'd uh, gone from a pretty, you know, quite a high to then all of a sudden a massive low, you know, being dropped and retiring and all this stuff. And um, so it's something I always wanted to do. And it was a perfect chance and um, perfect chance to work with, you know, these upcoming props, two different, you know, in Will and Kyle, two very different characters. One's, you know, from a council estate in Battersea, and one's in a slightly more affluent area and, and uh, you know, a slightly different background. And then obviously uh, Marla and the other boys. But as I said, um, I was very lucky to do it. I was lucky to have the chance even when I wasn't playing involved at John Kingston, you know, give me the chance to coach from, so I've been tech, I've been scrum coach really now, probably about three or four years really, because I had, you know, I sort of dipped my toe in with, um, when I was still playing and then when Graham Rountree came in, he allowed me to take the scrums and, uh, you know, it's been a constant, um, you know, it's, it's been a constant I've been doing now for three or four years. So what I have found is, a lot, same with Longy, because I played with the boys, I, you know, I find it hard to critique them or to be too hard on them. So it's always, it took, it's taken me a while to realise what the different personalities needed. So, for example, someone like Kyle would need, needs an arm around his shoulder. Well, I did then and he's probably not so much now, but 
you know, whereas Joe, because I played against him and, you know, because I'd done pretty well against him, I was able to tell Joe, you know, I was probably one of the lucky coaches, I can tell Joe, call a spade a spade sort of thing, rather than having to, like, listen to some of the bullshit he puts up with. So, you know, I was, you know, uh, but I did, you know, certainly around, um, I found it hard to, I was a bit pally with them and still played with them, gone from, even when I was playing, I still coached them a bit. So, you know, I found that pretty difficult. And then, again, for me, the big thing for me is, was, I'm always, it's always learning as much as scrummaging is very, you know, it's pretty black and white what you do, but, you know, there's always little different um, technical issues, different traits, different what. so it's, it's probably not as complicated as attack, but, you know, or a line out maybe, but, you know, there's always stuff you're learning and there's always stuff, you know, I guess I went in with a bit of an ego thinking, yeah, I know, I know everything about the scrum, but certainly in the last three or four years I've learned, I probably don't even know 75% of what's going on sometimes. And so it's always building up and learning different techniques, different traits. And, um, you know, I, I watch a lot of scrums, so, you know, probably don't want, you know, as long as he watches a lot of rugby, you know, I, <laughs> scrum's kind of the thing I focus on first and foremost and then I'll watch the game after so you know it's a lot of um, I think as I said I, I, I probably have to leave my ego to the door a bit and um, you know I am, I'm more open to ideas now you know I'm open to the boys challenging open to um, certainly um, it's not just my way or the highway it's my you know we're happy to you know we have a good discussion with the front row now it's kind of um, we meet you know, every Monday up in Starbucks and SSP and we, you know, we have a more of an informal chat and um, any clips I need to show them, I'll show them. But it's more of a, um, you know, coffee club and rather than, uh, you know, we all know it's the, probably the toughest position on the field being the front row. So it's, uh, you know, it's a, you know, make it as easy as possible for them. And I guess the, the point you make about video is that that plays a bigger and bigger part all the time. So being able to replay and, and say, look, have you seen how you're not binding quite right or, you know, the feed's not working, whatever, gives you a real opportunity to share and discuss easier. Yes, yeah, so it's a lot, you know, it's, um, a lot of it's done on the Sunday and then uh, individually on the Monday, but it, I think certainly with certain players with us, and when you come to the scrum, you know, it's a lot of it's attitude. And sometimes we haven't quite got that, so it's trying to get that coax out of them, which sometimes we have, but we're so inconsistent at the moment. It's, um, that's the frustration. This me then again, as a point Chris Rob showed me to me at the end of last year that I needed to manage my frustrations. Being slightly, I'm not, I'm not hot-headed, but, and it takes a lot to sort of wind me up and brighten me, but um, it would take me a, um, you know, it's, I, I guess coming from Wales, you get bollocked more. You know, the coach would shout a little bit, like, I mean, Lynn Jones coached me, you know, you know, these type of guys, they, they're a little bit more straight to the point and the Welsh boys kind of take it a bit easier for me than the English boys, certainly in Quinns. So, you know, when I, where I was trying to be hard and shout, you know, just get my point across, Rob would just said, look, you know, we don't need that. So, as you know, I've certainly tempered my, um, losing, losing my shit so much now. And, um, you know, it's, it's all done. I try to do it in a slightly less um, aggressive, confrontational annoyed and angry manner now so um which is something i've learned over the last of six seven months so you're learning new skills then <laughs> yeah. I, think it's, it's, um, I do you know like most scrum coaches you know you love scrummaging and love the scrum and you just get passionate about it and when the boys are you know not quite where they need to be when you know they can be up there a lot better it's uh yeah it's how i um manage my frustrations around that i think has been a big um a big learn on this year if, um, sorry, Martin, if I just can uh, yeah, just go. jump jump in there with Adam. I mean, I, I 100% understand where he comes from in terms of the, the frustration that he's talking about because I think us older players, when, uh, when we were young kids, 21 years old, and we come through the rank and you turn professional and eventually you play the game at a high level, you, I call it as you've worked hard to get to that point. Not that taking away any hard work that the kids are doing now. I'm just saying I think our circumstances and the way we got to where we got in, the, in our careers were a lot harder, tougher than what the kids have now um, with the academies and all the video analysis and, 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 and diets and all that stuff. So for me to come to a training session and I see these kids messing about and they're not switched on, as Adam said, uh, for to the right attitude at training, it's frustrating because you like, you, you think to yourself, you're a self-entitled little brat. 
you know, everything is done for you. Everything, uh, the, the way you got here was easy. Yes, you still have to do the hard work. Yes, you got to go to gym. I get it. But I think they just got it a little bit easier. So, and they, and they lose track of perspective of where they are in, in life and where they are and what they've achieved. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys or Adam. I don't know if you agree because you oh. work so hard to get there and you think these kids just rock up and they just mess about and you're like, dude, and you don't want to give them the, I told you so speech or the, when I played, it's not about that. But unfortunately we had a, a longer, bumpier road to get to the top where these kids today, they have an easy road to get to the top. And I, I think they forget that, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be there and in that position and to wear that Jersey. You know, so they, they've got to understand where our passion comes from. So I don't know if you agree with that, Adam. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, certainly, I think, again, Charlie Macron will have probably a better input on this from me as he's the, in the academy of the Queens, but they seem to think, um, certainly the senior academy boys with us, and the impression I get of them is the front row boys, they, they've made it already. Yeah. Where they, they've exactly. got their tracks, they got, you know, everything's, they get paid really well for academy, they've got a house to live in, and this. And there's no, um, and you know, there's a couple of, say, two players we've got, um, I found is, this is a constant battle, trying to get them, the good, very talented players, but it's a constant battle to get them to, you know, train hard, to put, you know, do the work, do the extras, do the throw in. Yeah. Uh, they both hookers, funny, want, you know, doing, doing the little bits to make them that better. Cause, and one's gone up, one was like a superstar coming through, like under 18, 16s and all this, but the other hooker who probably wasn't as good as him has gone above him because his work rate and work ethic is a lot better. So, you know, there's, we do, you know, reward boys who work hard and, um, yeah, it's just trying to get that, the entitlement out of it, which, you know, I'm sure is in same in every club, but uh, something I've definitely noticed up in uh, South West London. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you both. Okay, let me come to um, Andrew Coombs, if I may. Um, Andrew, obviously you took a slightly different transition, um, but I'm sure you've had some of the very similar challenges when you went into the business world and also into media. What was your thoughts? Yeah, just listening to the guys this morning, um, it's pretty similar to be honest with you. The transition from um, playing into business as it is from playing into coaching. You're managing a team, particularly with my business, I manage staff. Um, and as the guys are saying there, it's just all about developing people below you then and, and trying to get as much as you can out of them. So it's very similar. Um, my, my career as a, as a rugby player for the Dragons and, and, and Wales was a bit of a roller coaster, if I'm honest. Um, and um, when I was when I was 19, I, I had a contract with the Dragons. I sustained two um, severe shoulder injuries in those two years, um, and then lost my contract um, because I was unable to play effectively. Um, and at, at that point, I, I considered. Uh, stopping playing, my shoulders were no good. Um, so really, I've, I've transitioned twice because when when I um, when I lost my contract, I then had to go and find work and try and build myself back up to becoming a, a professional rugby player. A pretty traumatic time for me as well. At 21, actually, it was. Um, I lost my mother at the same time as I lost my contract. Um, and at that that point, they really question yourself as a person and uh, question what you want from life. And I, I think at that point, I, I got some core values, self-core values. We heard Phil talk about team core values. Um, I adopted some self-core values, and I didn't choose these. They kind of hit me in the face and, and became my core values. And I, and I kind of lived my life on those values, and those values were dedication, working as hard as I possibly could, and family. Obviously, the loss of my mother had a huge impact on that. Um, so I went to work for three years uh, for a software company. Um, he was actually owned by Sam Warburton's um, father-in-law. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he wasn't his father-in-law at the time, but uh, yeah. So I went to work for a software company for three years and I played uh, semi-professionally for Newport RFC. Um, and uh, luckily for me, I had an opportunity to go play for the Dragons at, uh, at 25. Um, played well and, and managed to get another contract. Um, played for the Dragons every couple of seasons. Managed to work my way up into the Welsh squad albeit there was a few injuries. Bomb was in the squad at the time. Um, so it was nice to, to have the opportunity to play with Big Bomb. Second row was the hardest position as well. I mean, no prop. Trying to keep you locked in. Um, 
Yeah, but um, you know, for, for me, my, my career was very traumatic. Um, as I said, I got capped for Wales at 28. I'd only been playing professionally really three years. And then at the age of 29, I sustained a career-ended injury to my knee. Um, dislocated uh, my knee. Had 10 operations in 14 months. And um, in the end, I lost, lost my battle with, with the injury. Um, so it was, it was a very traumatic career, as I said. Um, I'm blessed to have had the opportunities that I had uh, during my playing days. And I really do feel that they... Uh, gave me the springboard really to, to go into, into my next career, which was um, in construction. Uh, a company I own is Coombs Contractors, we're a fence and a landscaping specialist. Uh, and we work with the majority of the new build companies here in Wales and in south, uh, southeast of England. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been tough uh, transitioning. Um, really enjoyed it, but at the same time, I suffered massively with you know, depression after sport. Um, trying to overcome the injury, the support I received from my from my region was was pretty poor, if I'm honest. Um, and I think like the, the, I've, I've listened to the to the other chats you guys have been doing, and a lot of it's been around the transition after after um, rugby and what the clubs could be doing at the moment to, to educate the players and ensure that they're getting education behind them to go on and after their career. And if I'm honest, it's, it is difficult for the clubs. Um, you know, they pay the players a lot of money. Um, you know, they're in a results-driven industry where if they're not winning, coaches are under pressure, management are under pressure, directors become under pressure. Um, so I don't blame them in a way for trying to get every ounce out of the players they possibly can, um, because there is a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Um, for me personally, my experience, I think there's things that clubs and regions should be doing post-rugby for players that wouldn't cost them anything wouldn't affect their business in any way. Uh, and that is just put an arm on the players. Since I left the Dragons, I've had no contact with anybody really. Uh, not, not for the first three years, then a, a new CEO, a uh, chairman, sorry, David Buttress, who gave me a call when he came in. Uh, we sat down, had a coffee and, and discussed things. But um, yeah, for me, just a lack of um, relationship post-career, inviting players back to games, making them feel part of you know, what was their uh, family? As, as Phil spoke about, we, we talk about um, core values and talk about becoming a family. Well, when you, when you, when you retire, that shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't not be part of that family anymore, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, um, I think longevity is a, a key and making you feel valued now and in the future is, is, is huge. And, I'm going to bring Alan Davis in if I can. So Alan, just prepare yourself and come off mute. But Alan, years ago, you did some work. Obviously, you worked with Quinns, uh, which is a tie with Adam and Co. But you also did quite a bit of work regarding player welfare. Um, and, the you know, WRU did look to do things. Um, in the past, we've talked about the RPA and the clubs as well. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with what Andrew's saying, that, you know, that our arms around people is, is free of charge. Um, effortless in many ways um, and but we, we need to also I guess encourage the players to get involved in that as well yeah um, good, good to touch base guys um, obviously the Welsh boys probably know me better than um, than anybody but uh, yeah I've been involved for the last 20 years now in um, you can call it personal development in sport um, I was one of the original uh, what was known as the ace advisors after Korean education um, Coombs E Bomb and uh, Phil will still refer to me as Ace. Um, so that, that nickname has stuck. Um, but um, but even in the early days, it, it was just about sort of looking after guys with their education. But in 2003, uh, UK Sport and the home countries uh, developed a program called Performance Lifestyle, which then started to look more at uh, the lifestyle of athletes, players, uh, not just the education. But, you know, it's great listening to sort of, uh, you know, sort of Andre and Adam saying about the young, young players. And uh, this word entitlement comes up quite a bit. Uh, I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled to that. And it's like, no, you're not. You're not entitled to anything because you're, you're a normal person, you know, in a unique environment, you know, and sport is a unique environment. Um, but the, the, the great thing about sort of 
personal development is like it's taking the individual so it's not seeing the player it's seeing the person um no no two individuals are alike um so the work i've done over the 20 years and yes i was 10 years with uh, the welsh rugby union uh, before moving to higher education and looking at the elite athletes um then fortunately get a phone call from connor uh, asking if i was interested in taking up the personal development role up in the quins and that actually was probably my best two years personally because you worked at the club, you were employed by the club. Um, and I know they sort of re uh, replaced me when I re returned to Wales. Um, but it's so vital. I, I think we, we, we spent a lot of time talking about, uh, and as, uh, as Coombsy said, the, the ultimate transition, which is player retiring, but you actually start the transition from day one. Um, you know, the, so the, the career development, uh, sport is a short span. It is, a, you know, sort of a one part of your career. And it's the best time to actually develop all the other skills. Um, the, the frustration I've had with a lot of, yeah, maybe associations and everything is like, they want to do everything for the player. That's the worst thing you can do. The more you do for the player, the worse they are when they retire. <laughs> you know, because then all of a sudden it's like, where's my right arm gone? Um, and I, I agree with Andrew, it's like we can do it as a lifelong sort of, uh, um, sort of career development because somebody said to me the other day, you, you don't get your ideal job until you're 60 because it's probably your, your last. <laughs> so obviously, um, and I think we've gone from the historical or you leave school, you know, back in Wales, you used to leave school, probably end up in the mines for 40 years or you become a teacher for 40 years or... You know, you work an engineer for 40 years. Now, careers are different now. They're in little sort of blocks. So, you know, providing that support for the individual, it, it is about identifying transferable skills. Uh, you know, I, I know what Adam said about, you know, changing his attitudes and stuff like that, but that's natural in, in any industry. It's your behavior that actually, you know, sets the respect and sets the standard. Um, but sometimes you need to adapt. I don't say change. You don't change as a person, but you can adapt as a, an, an individual. Um, so for me, it's, you know, look, looking at the group there, I'm probably the non-coach. I, I, I never went. I didn't want to be on the grass, um, you know, after playing. Um, you know, so I think it's such a vital role. Yes, the associations play an absolutely massive role, and, and not just in rugby, in cricket, golf, um, the Jockeys Association all have the same philosophy about um, personal development. But Coombsy's right. It's like the minute that person retires, you lose touch with them. Um, and that's when they need more support. Um, so it is a lifelong, um, you know, sort of career sort of um, process. Um, and you're right, you know, I remember reading a great article and actually met the guy with Sugar Ray Leonard. And yet he still got on his passport, occupation, boxer. He said, you can refer to me as anything, but if you don't refer to me as a boxer, I'm not even an ex-boxer, that's my trade. But even in retirement, he's gone down a route of his own personal development of a business and no sort of running those business, learning and uh, continually learning. So, and, it, and it's been great listening to all the guys in previous uh, conversations in terms of, you know, the importance of personal development. But I think the way forward is that when the club, not an association, but when the clubs, and I know Quinns are one, um, Saracens were another, and Wasps, I think we're the only three in England, employ somebody as a personal development manager. So, um, you know, that, that, that's the way forward, I think, for, for everything. I think player development comes down to the player as well, my now, like you say in there. They've got a huge responsibility to take action themselves as players. I mean, like from my, from my case, when I was playing, um, I didn't take anything for granted really because of what I lost at the start of my career, losing my contract, then having to go back out and work. When I come back into the system at 25, I continued to work. I found companies that needed work done on a consultancy basis, anything. I would approach companies, ask them, can I help you? Can I be of any assistance to you? 
uh, players just don't do it anymore. And it's, it's so frustrating to see that they want everything on a plate. Um, they've got to be prepared to put themselves out there. And, uh, small things like box visits um, at, at games, you know, injured players, players not select, they've got opportunities to go into boxes and meet with clients. Lots of them don't know even know to open the door and get in there and just start talking. You know, it's, they, they, they could do with um, training for that, I suppose. Um, there's opportunities. Behind those doors are opportunities. And the players just walk in and they think it's all about them. And I've been, I've, I've been um, guilty of this at times. The players open the doors and they expect, if, 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 the, if the guests inside the boxes don't ask questions to the players, they probably won't talk. It's, it's interesting you're saying that, Andrew, and um, it's one of the bigger things in the last five years, especially when I came back to Wales. Um, it, things like that was deemed to be a chore yeah. rather than, an, I wouldn't say a necessity, but it was the opportunity um, on several occasions. And you, you're spot on. Some of the young guys that we talk about, the, the, the biggest skill that you, you can have, and we've all got it. I'm looking around the group here now. If you, if you sat down and looked at your network, not just rugby network, but people you've met over the years and friends, your networks go, goes into three, 4,000 people. Um, but, you know, while you're playing, the opportunities, you know, that shake of a hand or a meet and, meet and greet could be the next employer. The, when I came back to Wales two years ago, three years ago, um, it was unbelievable. It was like a chore rather than... but even giving them the opportunity to say, right, maybe they are nervous, they don't have the communication skills. I, I was emphasizing, so let's put a training course on or something on to help these guys. But again, I think what was happening was like, people were holding their hands and taking them through the door, uh, rather than, no, no, let's open the doors for them and it's up to the player. And I, I've said this from day one in 20 years, um, and this like, I'm not the expert, <laughs> you, know, in, you know, I've got a passion for my profession, which is personal development in sport. Um, but, you know, my skill is about exploring and sort of guiding, advising, and you're spot on, it's up to the individual. They are the ones that have to go through that door. We can open the doors for them, but they have to go through the door. And you're right, I think I've seen it in 20 years. Um, you know, I, I always say this, you know, it's like, the first two people I actually met in my role 20 years ago, uh, the first one was Gavin Henson. The second one was Jamie Roberts. For me, probably one of the most talented rugby players. But then the other one was a passionate, worked hard at his rugby, but just was passionate about learning. Um, you know, and they're two great guys, you know, but two different people. But you work with people differently and you work with them um, as individuals rather than you know again one of the one of the big things I used to find is like so you know you speak to a player and you say oh what are you doing that oh well he's doing it <laughs> why have you got that oh well he's got one and it's, it's going back to that why are you spending all your time down in Costa well that's what we all do <laughs> rather than maximizing those two hours or three hours and I think coming back and I think somebody I think I think Tim said in one of the previous uh, sessions I think early on, unless, it, unless it's part of the weekly schedule, the players, and I, I remember, uh, no, Bomb, Bomb will remember this up in Harlequins, I had a long conversation with the coaching, you no know, back, you no know, people like John and Tofty and people. It was like, it, it's, um, players tend to be sort of like schedule driven. Um, so they know in advance, you know, what time they start, what time they finish. And I used to call it the car key jangle. If you knew that they were finishing at half past two, they'd gone at half past one. <laughs> yeah? And Tim is nodding his head. Yeah? And I said to King, uh, J JK one day, I said, it'll be interesting um, if on one of those day schedules you didn't give a, an end time. So let's say the, f the, the final session was started at half past one, but it, you didn't give an end time. And I think they did it on one occasion. And I said, watch the reaction of players. Players were like straight away going, what time are we finishing? What time are we finishing? And, you know, we didn't say anything, but it was like, look, you know, we'll finish when we finish. So they, they turned up on the pitch at Apus One, um, thinking they were probably going to be there until five o'clock, having a beast in. Uh, I think 40 minutes later, it turned out to be the best 40 minutes that you have had because they all switched on. We better get this right and let's really work hard. 
Um, but it was just that mindset of, yeah, I'm here to do a job, but taking, taking that way, that sort of schedule, rather than being, let's self-manage. And that's what Coombs is right. I think the personal development philosophy for me is about creating sort of skills and developing skills to become self-managing. So when you do retire, whether you go into coaching and you, like Bomb and everybody else needs to readapt their skill set, um, it's about self-management. If you go into a different world, um, that you, you're capable of making decisions, uh, you've got your communication skills and Coombs is one of the, you know, a great example, as he said, probably from his upbringing and everything else he's gone through, he was already preparing for that eventuality. I think I'm looking at it from a business point of view as well, Al. Obviously, I've gone from being a player who's expected the club to do things for me, who, who, who's expected the club to put things in place for me post-career. But then I'm now running a business where I'm managing my own staff and paying them to do a job. If they come to me and said, I want you to train me up for my next stage of my career, it's not going to be with you. It's going to be somewhere else. I, I find it very difficult to say to them, yeah, okay, I'll pay you to go and learn to become something else and then move on. You know, I, I understand that careers end and they have to end because you can't be part of that circle forever. But I'm just looking at it from a financial point of view and a business point of view. I can see why the regions and clubs in England, France, wherever, don't do more to help their players progress on the next stage in their career. And, and also, the other final point for me is like, um, and you guys have obviously transitioned, most of you, into coaching, which is brilliant. Because not every player, every, I think a lot of players do think that, oh yeah, don't worry, I'll finish playing, I'll have a job uh, coaching. Um, gosh, guys, no, there's not many coaching jobs out there. Um, but what I'm amazed by is that the clubs, some do, but the clubs don't recognise skill sets with some of those players for other roles within job in in the clubs i.e marketing commercial uh pr um you know sort of even in sort of you know team manager roles <laughs> yeah you know it's like not identifying sort of those skill sets for those players to move into to as you say to continue being part of the family um but yeah you know it's uh, but again i think what we got to remember is like no two individuals are alike so you know, you can do something, some are, are proactively good learners, where other, others just need that practicality and, um, you know, the practical skills. Mark, you don't move, Mark. Sorry, guys, the mute wouldn't come off quick enough for me. Um, thank you, Alan. That was spot on. Really appreciate you saying that. Phil, did you want to dive in and say something from a Nib Namibia side? Yeah, well, yeah, just, but just following on from Alan's point and Coombsy's point, you know, in particular about players going, uh, you know, and using their network when they're playing. You know, I, when I was playing, I remember we, we played, I think we played Scotland in Cardiff one day in 1994, and then we went back to the Copthorne Hotel and we used to have a, uh, an hour where you could mingle with all all the supporters. Well, some of the more um, well, some of the sponsors, if you like. And I learned early on there how effective that could be because I remember I was working for a uh, waste manager, metal reclamation demolition company in Croissants for a sponsor Clashley. And uh, I remember meeting this guy Trevor James, great bloke. Went and did a coaching session from for him in Denver, and then ended up having a fantastic. Uh, it ended up being a quarter million pound contract for the company. So you learn early on, well, I did anyway, learned early on the importance of networking and, and speaking to different people. And one of the, I think one of the best players I've seen doing it, and some of the boys know Kerry Sweeney, when I was at the Blues with Kerry, he was absolutely fantastic, like Andrew was saying, in using his network uh, and, and helping him to develop his his electrical business, which, you know, he, he's, he's transitioned very successfully into that. Now, when he, again, Alan's mentioned Jamie, there were a few other players, but Kerry was one of the guys I felt, he was, he was fantastic about giving his time, meeting people, and it, and it ended up giving him a really, you know, a really good transition in, from rugby into business then, you know. Um, and Phil, was, yeah, just, okay. Phil, just to chip in on that, and that, that was a great example because I worked with Kerry at that time. Kerry did his degree in uh, applied science. Um, 
got his degree, but then didn't, still didn't have a clue what he wanted to go into. And he was an employer, one of the sponsors, he was an electrical guy, an uh, electrical company that he met. Um, and it was something called Something and Son. Right. So um, uh, Kerry said, oh, so you obviously got a son that you're gonna leave the business to. And he went, no, I am the son. And he said, and I don't have anybody to leave the business. And this guy was 60. Yeah. And Kerry then start, went and retrained. Um, he retrained in sort of like um, electrical testing and grew other skills. And as you say, next thing he knew, he um, could, you know, carries on playing rugby uh, for quite a long time, but had other interests and another income, which was probably far greater than what his rugby was. Yeah, he was terrific in, in that. There's been, you know, there's a few other guys, you know, Snees, I remember, we were just in Marshall at Leeds, and he was never shy about going in to meet sponsors. Marshall was always off the pitch, up he'd go, blah, blah, blah. And he was, he was, you know, he was brilliant at it, to be to be fair. I know Adam would have played at the Ospreys but as well, so you might know what I mean. But um, it is important to understand. And again, well, it comes back to understanding, you know, the skills you have, how you can transfer them, the network that, that you're currently operating in and making... You know, not, not taking advantage of it, but, you know, using it, um, you know, for the benefit of yourself and ultimately the, the benefit of others. But one last point that, you know, I'd like to make, and it's been brought up by Adam uh, Coombsy, you brought it up, Alan Snees, was that entitlement bit. And I just, the experience we had, you know, in Namibia when we first took over, it was very much a senior player-led um, environment. And they felt they were entitled to have everything and anything, and there was about seven of them, great guys in many ways, about seven of them, the rest, you don't play the game with seven people, you know, obviously you play with 15, you've got a squad of 30 on. So what, what, what happened, as the four years evolved, people like Jacques Berger, who was a brilliant captain and uh, leader for the group had left, but some of the other senior guys were still there, and it was all about them, not the, the other players. So what we ended up doing, taking Andrew's point about team values are important, but more so individual values. And we did, we did a sort of a diagnostic test with them called Strength Finder, which is all about you know, improving self-awareness and then that would improve their awareness of others. And as the years went by, you know, they identified their personal values. We were then able to identify more clearly the team values that were needed to go on and succeed at the World Cup, or to compete. You know, we're never going to beat the All Blacks and and, uh, and South Africa and, and Italy and the likes of the Tier 1, but we wanted to be competitive. And we were for 30 minutes against, 35 minutes against New Zealand. We're only 10-9 down. The scoreboard is a bit ugly in the end, but, you know, that was, for me, that was a real proud moment. It was a culmination of the work and the effort the players had put in, uh, you know, into themselves, and into the team, and we became a great team. You know, that really helped. But it was, as Coombsy's point was, it was only when they started to look inside themselves and understand themselves more that they actually then were more appreciative of others. And that was a real, that was a really good experience of, of self-awareness, increasing your awareness of others. Thanks, Phil. And, and it builds into what World After Sport are looking to achieve, really, and something that I talked to Alan about before, the call um we've got a strap line of the business of you which is all about the athlete being a business in themselves knowing that they have to market themselves they have their own finance department they have their own communications department and whilst they're in sport there's the greater opportunity to utilize that intellectual property to utilize where they are today to utilize the fact that all of those networks are around them um, on a regular basis and I couldn't agree more that having a um, an ability to to network and help the players and the athletes network in a smart and intelligent way so when they do rent to that box um, which has got 20 or 30 businesses in it you know how to how say play the room um, I've been to many business seminars and many business events where you know you've got 50 60 70 businesses there and you're expected to talk um, easily and enter into a crowd of people it's not a comfortable and easy experience um, even though that as a player and an athlete I would suggest that people want to talk to you creating that conversation is the challenge and a lot of what we're talking about here is also transferable skills 
because a lot of the things that are done on a pitch are done in training are done in sport are absolutely transferable into the business world which is where i come from um and what i've had to do um so you know the ability to talk as a group the ability to get your messages across like adam was saying about you know it's not necessarily just about bollocking people but it might be about encouraging someone or or going to andrew's comment about wrapping your arm around someone everything we do as leaders as people is about identifying that people are different people have a different um desire of to what to receive some want that bollocking some want that arm around them and as a leader it's about identifying with that and and i and working with that and i'm hoping like i've said is that world after sport is very driven very motivated to learn from what stimo's brought in from all of you guys are saying to say do you know what yes you players are responsible to a certain degree clubs to bring you through the door to encourage um associations to do the same and then the player to take responsibility um of, of taking that to the next level and want to learn and a bit like sean said as well right at the outset is want to learn want to develop want to t listen to other people's thoughts ideas recommendations also the things that didn't go well so that we know we're not to you know try that at uh, that action that uh, has, has failed 10 times so that we can become better coaches, better leaders, um, and better people as a whole. Um, and some of the studies that we've worked with and talking to Steve Anson, who sadly couldn't join us today, he was saying about the importance of, you know, off the field actually triggers improvements on the field for athletes. And having that, those, those interests outside of, let's say, rugby or sport actually drive you and motivate you more and maybe help some of those entitlements Phil, that Phil, you brought in there. So, you know, very, very keen that from a world after sport perspective, that they're the drivers, the motivators that, that help us push, hopefully push us along. Well, Marty, sorry, sorry to chip in there, but, um, and, and, and you're right. You know, we, I think we all sing off the same in sheet, but the one thing in, in the last conference I spoke at, um, it was all about player welfare. It was all about, let's look after the players. And my question was, who looks after the coaches? Who, look, who looks after the retired guys? And it was like, it went quiet until, oh yeah, well the associate, yeah, the association have an alumni, but it's not looking after and you no know, coach welfare and coach development. You know, I think coach education is totally different. Coach development is what Phil talks about and what probably Hoggy talk, talks about in, you know, in his roles. No. You know, you're saying that, Al, about the alumni. The, the, there is no alumni at the moment in my book, if I'm being totally honest. And, and, and again, that comes from players now. The mindset of players now is that they want everything for free or they want everything for as little as possible. They, if, if they could change their mindset and look at their lives after rugby, what, what are they going to do? I'll take Harry Robinson's. Uh, Keith, for instance, young uh, international player for Wales, a successful player, had a severe career-ended injury, then had to go and work. He's trained up to become a mortgage advisor or financial advisor. He's got his own company. The player should be using him constantly or, you know, anybody else that's retired, they should be using these people. In my case, you know, I've got a landscaping firm which, which we do private work for. I'm not saying the players have the company, but give an opportunity. Um, the amount of players I've had text me asking me to come and look at their gardens to do works, and then there's always at the end of the text mates rates. <laughs> well, for me, if you're a mate, you will pay the rates that are required to get the works done. That's supporting me. Now it will work in their favour then if you change a culture because when they retire, they will have the same service. They will have players buying from them, and I just think it gives you a head start in life in your career if they can change that culture now instead of having things for free instead of having things for as little as possible pay for it and it'll serve you when, when you retire as well and and andrew you, you're spot on you know I, I was referring to the alumni in the rpa this is it's far oh. bigger than what's it was in the wrpa but no you, you're right my my sort of strap line has been for the last few years and phil will know this is about um so what's a professional rugby player and i go a normal person living an abnormal but unique life and we forget that they're normal people. In other words, when you go to normality, you don't get things for free, you don't get things for nothing, so you've got to start to learn to 
invest not only in your time but also you know you you, you pay for what it costs it's like it's, it's like for instance bomb bombers wrote a book adams wrote a book no one part of me would ever think to say to text bomb and say oh can i have a copy of your book for free i've actually got bombs book downstairs and what i did i went aboard there because that support i'm finished yet bomb we've got about six on the go I get, um, I get I get twenty five pence out of one book. Cheers. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy you. Uh, Can I just go to go to Johan because yeah, I'm conscious Johan, you've got to duck off uh, in a few couple of minutes. But Johan, obviously, you've got a slightly different story as well. Yeah, well, well, from somebody that comes from a, like a sports me uh, media background and now having studied psychology for six years, working in a psychiatric hospital, I'm obviously a little bit biased in my views and I. I try to see everything from a psychological point of view, but from listening to everybody, I've just realized again how important it is, it is firstly for a player who goes and to become a coach to get to know themselves on a, a deeper level. Because all of a sudden, when you become a, a coach, having been a player, you are now responsible for others as well. I think kind of when you're a player, you still expect the coaches to look after you in a certain way and you expect them to have their lives sorted out. But now you're making that step up and I, and I think it's really, really important to get to know yourself on a, a much deeper level because you are now responsible for other people as well. So you need to know why do you want to become successful? What is it that makes you want to achieve things? What is it that, uh, that uh, your family background is telling about yourself? What are your morals uh, and all of that? And I think to try and use that to maximize your success one day and to maximize what you want to achieve and I, I think a couple of people spoke on that already. And it's actually, it's such a simple thing to do, but it does take a little bit of effort in the beginning just to sit and realize, why do I feel this way about certain things? This person made a comment to me. Why does that affect me in a different way? And uh, just to do a lot of introspection as well, because I think doing that will make you much more effective as a coach as well, because you'll start to realize patterns in other people's behavior and patterns in other way and, and the, the things that your players are also doing. Um, and I, I'm really encouraged by, by Andrew's story because obviously he's had some huge events happen to him and the way that he's been able to deal with it and the success that he's been able to make um, of, uh, of himself. Uh, I'm, I'm really inspired by that. But, but I think those events, losing his mom uh, and, and also those, those injuries, forced him to do a lot of introspection as well. And, and I think you mentioned there, you, you thought about your core values and you became, kind of became more self-aware. And I'm sure that has also, um, that, has, that has benefited you a lot later on in your, in your different careers as well, as difficult as it was during those times. You, you mentioned there um, going through some, some depression uh, phases as well. And, and yeah, like I said, I'm really inspired by that because I think some players would get to those points and not be able to handle, not being able to handle that and, and they might crack and they might fall off the wayside. But uh, obviously you, you had some inner strength and I'm sure some support as well to be able to do, to do that. And then I think also to transfer some of that learnings onto the players as well. Andre mentioned there, players coming and they feel entitled, the young guys, they maybe have a little bit of an easier road. But I think it's also really important to try and understand why do they feel entitled? What is their family background telling about themselves? Their parts might have become a little bit easier and try, just trying to get you behind that a little bit and understand where those feelings come from and then try and work with that. Um, and I think a lot of players and especially coaches do have that capacity. I think some players are a little bit more complicated and you need a little bit of a deeper insight and maybe somebody like a, a psychologist to kind of work through some of the players as well. But I think until a lot of those issues aren't resolved, you're not going to be able to get the player to as high a level as you can. Some players have the natural talent and they'll be able to go to really high levels without doing that. But in order to get the best out of the players, I think it might be, uh, that, that's something that's really important. And then, yeah, lastly, I also, I think Phil mentioned it in the beginning um, about meeting different players' needs. And I think it just goes back to, to Maslow's hierarchy. Um, and, and it's such a simple concept also just to be aware of uh, constantly is, is what are these players' needs? And firstly, their physiological needs. You need to be able to feed your family. You need to be able to feed yourself. You need to be able to sleep well at, at night. And then secondly, there's a safety and security. And I think that's going to be a massive thing going into the future after COVID-19 passes, because I think there's so much uncertainty at the moment. Am I going to get paid? How much am I going to get paid? Am I going to have a job after this? In order for the players to really be able to reach that self-actualization level at some point, 
those needs need to be met first. And I think that's going to be a really tough task for the CEO of the companies. And I think there, that's also where the coach has a really important uh, uh, role to play is just being that link between the players and uh, the different, uh, the management levels in the, in the sides as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I really enjoyed this, this talk and I, I've really learned a lot from, from all the different uh, coaches in this, uh, in this chat as well. Brilliant, thanks Johan. Tim? Yeah, I just think Johan's done a brilliant um, synopsis of what's been going on, but it comes right back to what Longy said, I think right at the start, was you know, the, the northern phrase of being cock-blocked. This is, this is going out there. But um, the idea that you ought to understand the, what the, the fears are of the other coaches that you're working with. And once you understand what their agenda is, uh, aligned to what your agenda is, you know, basically, unless the culture's right, unless we all believe that we're doing this for the team, and it doesn't matter whose idea it is, but we'll, we'll all agree that the idea is the best idea, we'll all get behind it, and that'll become our philosophy and we'll back it. Yeah. But if, if, if we've all in this conversation been having to realise that you know, um, you know, maybe I've been a bit aggressive and I could bollock people in Wales because that's how I was brought up. But down in London, you're going to get offended. And people, so we've just got to understand the art of communication that Alan's been talking about and understanding how, how does my impression on this room impact on other people. And if you can understand what you need, then you can be motivated forever. Then you can understand what the impact of your behavior has on other people. And when I was working with Phil at Leeds, it was so important to make sure that we had different voices leading the group. Um, so it wasn't just Phil banging the drum. I remember walking with you, Phil, at seven in the morning. You were asking me stuff like, you know, how is the feeling of the players? And it was a different voice. It might be the scrum half one day, the fly half the other day, a forward. But we were making the same point to get the message across, but rotating the strike. Um, and it's just understanding... Um, I think as a coach, these are, these, are, these are the most important transferable skills we've got. As a player, you're self-resilient, you overcome adversity, and I'm inspired by you, Andrew, massively from what you've done. Um, but then going on into business or into coaching, the, the job is just 100 times harder. You've got to be aware of how everybody's emotions are tied up with their behavior. And, and giving people the benefit of the doubt, putting the arm around the shoulder, putting the extra yardage in, extra time with all those players, so that they believe that you're, as a coach, going to help them achieve their dreams. So for me, it starts with finding out from the player, what do you need? How can I help you achieve that, that mission? This is our plan. And for me, the business of you is, um, is another way of saying, how can we help each individual coach, individual player, uh, understand their strengths and know how to market and sell their strengths into the community, into the culture, so that everybody feels you're an asset, not a threat. Uh, I found that in, I got labeled the professor, shit man, I read one book, but in a, in a rugby environment, that was a threat to a lot of coaches. So the, the important thing is, is understanding the fear, making sure that people around you know that you're on their side, you know, you're a friend in the butts, you're, you're, you're basically, we're here to, to achieve, achieve the same mission. Nothing I'm doing is trying to put you down. Uh, everything I say is for your benefit and together we'll go and achieve uh, bigger dreams than we could ever possibly dream, dream for on our own. Um, so really, this is it. I, I completely agree that when I left rugby, I had a real struggle in transition. I just took jobs from, from people in order to earn a living. To be honest, I was coaching and I was doing my development as a coach, but I was living in Chiswick in London. And I couldn't afford to carry on coaching. I had to go and get jobs with sponsors and I had to earn a living. So for me, I'd like to be able to give back to coaches and players so you've got more of a plan um, you know more about your strengths. So, for example, if you know your strengths, you can go in. You can you can choose a club to work for, in the knowledge that they need you. You're not just being given a job because you're a name. You've got to work out the culture that you're going into to make sure that that's going to inspire you to be the best coach you possibly can be. And unless we spend time introspecting, uh, like Alan's been saying, learning about ourselves, then we're going blind. And we're certainly not blind as players. We spent 25 years developing those skills. So we're going to have to invest in our coaching career as well. But hopefully we can invest um, the development as, of, of the whole person so that we are very good coaches, very good dads, um, and very good in business in the end. Yeah, That's enough. <laughs> that makes sense, guys. I think, I think Tim... The, the key thing, you know, I think over my journey since 19, 
96, I think it was, is, is, is learning from failure. I know people don't maybe like talking about that at times, but learning from failure. But the more important thing is looking, as, as a few people have mentioned, you on yourself, is looking inwardly to make sure that you know you can you can really reflect well on on what you you know what has happened, uh, and take everybody else out of the equation. You know, and just look at yourself, um, look inwardly. You know, have a look at you know revisit your values or or, or 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 develop you know your values if you already haven't got them, and that's what I've found really really important over time. I didn't do it very well in the beginning. Uh, but over time, the more and more experience I've got, I've realised that the things we used to do, you know, when I used to, Hog used to cost me a fortune in cake and biscuits when I was in Leeds, taking them, you know, Snaze used to cost me a fortune in bourbon and coke, right, or Jack Daniels, uh, Snaze, same with you, Stim, used to cost me a lot of money in breakfast, and no, but it's, the, as you go on, the more and more you learn about the importance, as I said at the beginning, of relationships and, and rapport with players, uh, and making you know making them feel special in a way, but also being a bit tough for them, you know when their behaviours aren't um, you know conforming to the team or that they're not you know doing all the things that require no talent type of thing, you know. And it's just being a good bloke, being a good teammate. So for me, it's it's learning you know learning from those failures and and being very reflective inwardly has been you know is very important. I think as we've all sort of alluded to at one time or another during the conversation. Yeah, cool. Johan's just got to duck out. Sadly, you've got to move on. So, Johan, thanks ever so much for joining us. Thanks, Ryan. Sure having you join us again soon. Get that hair done. <laughs> uh, Cheers. Thanks so much. Look after the young ones. Cheers. Cheers. I was, I was just going to say, Phil, on that one, one thing, again, in the corporate world that we are assessed on as, as um, employees, as, as people, is not just the what you deliver, but how. Yeah. So it is very focused on the behavioural side of your your um, actions. So you can't go around upsetting everybody. Um, you can't, you know, bollock everyone if you fancy it. It's about your personal behaviours as much as as important. And there was always a matrix, um, a grid matrix, if you like, left to right. One was going up saying how you perform one was going from left to right saying the what and obviously you then had to place yourself in there as a well i behaved really well this year and um but also um this is what i delivered i achieved my objectives this year i i, I hit my sales target for example but if you hit your sales target and perform, perform badly your bonus reflected that you you may have got a good bonus but you would have got a great one if you'd have been, um, if you'd have behaved in the right way and 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 measured and, and assigned yourselves to those, almost to those beliefs that you put on the presentation at the start, if you buy into what we're going to do and how we expect you to do it, great. We don't just expect you to deliver the results; we expect to behave in the way that this club or this country expect you to behave as well. Yeah, one of the interesting things, Mark, that I've found. Work, or, you know, working in with businesses, we we did a we did a leadership workshop with um, Network Rail, Carillion and Murphys. I think it was about two years ago uh, when uh, the Carillion crash came. Sorry, and these these three companies, Kelpre, they were sorry, Kelpre, Network Rail, and Murphys, and they then were the team that were responsible for building the link, the Transpenna link between Leeds and. Manchester and they'd never been in a room before these guys and they were all about managing a process they were managing a process that they had to hit targets it was all about the bottom line but they, they they were very very weak at actually looking at leadership in terms of how to lead the people because they needed to get a little bit extra out of them because they were under pressure to finish the project so that taught me a huge lesson in terms of management is all about the process I know this might sound obvious but people uh, sorry, leadership is all about the people and trying to get the best out of them. Uh, and that was a big lesson, you know, that, that I learned listening to these guys. And in the end, when we got them together the first time, it was, uh, that was the only time that they'd been in a room together. And they'd been, they, the team started about 18 months prior to that. So it was a, it was a real, you know, developing uh, a very dynamic process, which we did about six or seven sessions with them. Uh, and it's very interesting, but it's it's all about the people again and getting them to, you know, behave and also getting the management to behave in a way that, that shows the employees that, you know, they're caring about them. And it's not just about 
hitting the bottom line all the time. Or Phil, on that target. point, if I come back to Sean Long's example at the start about you being blocked as a coach, yeah. that frustrates the hell out of me. Exactly. Because um, from, your, from your behalf, not, not for me, but if you've got all that proven ability and all that talent and you're not being able to get that into the group, I mean, how, I mean, Alan, how, how, do we, how do we let a coach who's got so much ability break into a, a, a management structure which isn't listening? How can we do that? It, funny, I've, as, as I've been listening to the conversation and um, just through experience of the last couple of years, and, um, you know, I always remember you know, being up in Quinns with James Horwell. Now, he was the opposite. He didn't want to go into coaching, but didn't want to know... Um, you know, sort of where you wanted to go and very similar to, to Andrew. So in the end, it was like, okay, let's get you in front of or as an, as an observer on, you know, other boards. <laughs> so it could have been like, you know, Sport England or EIS or Surrey Sports Park. And he did. He, he actually went and sat in on a couple of the, you know, sort of just board meetings. And after about two or three, he started realizing, oh, my God how similar everything was to what he'd developed over the last 12 years in the rugby field. Cause it was all about teens. It was all about performance. It was all about, you know, guys going off sick and you know, how do you replace them? Just like injuries. So absolutely. You know, when you say about Sean, you know, being blocked or anything and, you know, and I do know is that there's been a lot of coaches or players who've gone into coaching um, and I think, I, I don't know if you've all been watching, is it the Netflix on the cricket, the test? And like, you know, Justin Langer, what did he do? He brought three ex-players in, not just because they were ex-players, but because of the person and the people they were, to be able to you know, communicate properly um, and co communi co communicate correctly. Um, and it's about somebody, you know, giving that opportunity. And I think it comes from the top. Um, if you've got a leader or a head of rugby or a director of rugby who recognizes your skill set, the players may take a long, long time in adapting to that person's skill set. Um, but you've got to keep your values, you know, you've got to keep your sort of beliefs and adapting the communication style. And I'm sure Sean has done that over the last year. He's, he's, and people forget, I think this is the trouble we get in, the, in a lot of sport, you know, People like I'm looking at Phil here now, Phil, Carl, and people like that, and yourself. It's like you're not the same person as you were 10 years ago, <laughs> you know. And people, but people do, oh, yeah, I remember him playing, and oh, he's a you know, tough nut, or he's a hard nut, and oh, yeah, I remember Coombs, you know. There. But then when they sit down with them now, they go, oh my god, look at the experience you've got, look at the skill sets you go, because they're different in a different climate, different environment. So, um. So it, it, it is about so that our transition from playing to coaching and just having your own beliefs, not changing your values, but adapting. And it's adapting through learning, you know, learning and experiencing from other people. Yeah, I think we, can, we were in a conversation on Monday with a couple of lads who've gone into teaching, uh, Rob Rawlinson, Dan Scarborough, and they were thinking, oh, I, w I was hot then, but I'm not now. And, that, and I don't agree with that. I think they've just got to carry on adapting and remembering they've earned those skills that will last them forever. And they've just got to learn almost to you know how to get them out, those, those transferable skills and how to really, un they were undervaluing their own talents. And I think it's really important that for all of us, and this is part of that network maybe, and that remembering that we are quite an elite group of people, not in an arrogant way, just we're quite different. And I think, um, but we then have to earn and earn the right to be high performing in our next environment. And we can help each other do that rather than all go into our own little silos and hang on to our one sponsor and stop talking to each other. And I think it's, it, it does come back to what uh, Johan was saying is about self-awareness. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, I spoke to Bomb about mentoring. They, a lot of people use the word mentoring, but actually there's a skill to mentoring. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't tell people, if I was you, I'd do this. <laughs> You'd really work with them to say, what's your thought process? No, what, no, what do you see? What do you sort of, you know, sort of think, uh, but have you thought of this? And you start to, you know, explore for them to come up with a solution. And once they feel more confident, they go, oh my gosh, yeah, I can adapt. I can transfer skills. And, uh, and that's why I keep on coming back to it. It's like, it's brilliant listening to everybody. And after 20 years, and you still have, you know, 
you know, and Coombsy will back me up here, you will still have personal development managers in association and everything who will do everything for those players and they'll do anything for them. But again, it's like, yeah, you know, he's doing a good job. He's a good crack and everything. You've got to be a critical friend. You've got to be that sort of, you know, encouraging and exploring because at the end of the day, it's about developing your skills, you know, and as you say, you become a different person then 10 years down the line. Yeah, and we want the, everyone to take responsibility and ownership for their own development. So when I sat down with Martin, you know, a year ago, and we talked about how do we start offering some sort of solutions and support packages. One of the things I said was I want the players to be invested in it or the coaches to be invested. If you're giving it for nothing, then they'll treat it like nothing. Uh, so it's this that real catch 22 that we want to, we want people to invest and be, and, and, and then demand results. And then you'd be far more engaged in your own development rather than being given something for nothing and then saying, oh, well, I'm not going to bother. Has anyone else got any, got any questions or thoughts? You know, we've, we've been rabbiting on a bit and there's a few guys I don't know and I'm sure you've if got can, things to if add. If I can just, I just want to come to a couple of people to know first, if I may. Um, there's two words that I like to think about when we, with all we've talked about and then I'm going to come to you, Dylan. Um, leadership and management. And the reason I say that is because I used to think I wanted to be a manager. I thought the manager was the pinnacle, the biggest thing in the world. And, you know, um, actually being a leader was the thing that I really wanted to do and still want to do. Um, you know, I'm not here to tell people what to do. I'm here to encourage people, support people, give them the backing, give them the understanding. A bit like we've done, Tim, with, um, with some of our stuff is, is really just it's, it's helping them on the journey, not telling them how I, I think they should do it. It's opening their eyes and opening the doors and opening the windows to say, here's the way, mate. Take your pick which way you go. Um, and I'm here to back you and I'm here to support you every step of the way. So, Dylan, sorry, come to you, mate. Uh, all good. So, I think it, I'm probably coming from a bit of an academy biased uh, position here, but a lot of the stuff that the messages have been coming around has just really triggered, the, I think, the importance of that academy period and some of the topics we spoke about last week around having structured uh, structured ingrained development programs in our academy academy systems to get you know potentially two to five years of a player with this type of skills outside of rugby and by the time they actually get to a professional you know where alan was talking about things were a chore for some of these players around going into and meeting sponsors and all the rest but all of a sudden if they've had two to five years of conditioning of all this, the skills outside of rugby and like ando said last week it's it's making them aware of it's, it's the journey rugby is not just their end game you know, it's just part of the journey so that awareness to you know really see value in meeting these other people and you're not just a rugby player but you know i think this can really set them up post-career it'd be a lot easier transition uh when we get them in those earlier years to try and make it not so much a chore to them absolutely thank you um seb and charlie i've not come to you guys at all um i've, I've been really mean and let everyone else rabbit have you guys got anything to say? I think I'd, I'd probably just emphasize what um, what Dylan said there. You know, I'm, I'm lucky to work with both him and Ando on on a daily basis, and um, you know, we're we're consistently struck by how common the themes that are being discussed this evening are. Um, you know, across all levels of the game and and all the different levels of players that we interact with, whether it's um, you know our academy players or players that have transitioned into the the early years of um, you know their careers, and you know I think some of the common themes around expectations and you know players wanting things on a plate um you know the lack of clarity at times around what our role is you know is it to do everything for them is it to you know and that's my perception you know to to open the door but we can't walk through it they have to do it themselves so i really agree with what alan was saying earlier um but i think as well you know one of the challenges we face is you know how do we actually embed this type of development into their development as a person you know as an athlete that it's not an add-on it's not something where we have a workshop or a seminar it's actually built into um you know our our development pathways our development programs and you know where we're really sort of um attacking that that sort of area at the moment of you know who you are and what you do are are two separate things and they're connected but, you know, are we as deliberate in our development of the person as we are in the player from an academy perspective? And I don't think we are. And it's something where we're trying to put a lot of time and effort into in terms of being 
deliberately developmental around the person and the player. Fantastic. I don't envy you on that challenge, though. That's going to be a toughie. <laughs> okay, Hoggy, I've not given you much uh, voice yet. Uh, just the, the point I was going to make, Martin, was um, we're, we're talking about successful teams. For me, that comes from stability. Um, so stability from the board and then by your director, rugby head coach. And that comes over a period of time of consistent behaviours. Um, so I'm listening to Longy and Baum talk about coaching. To me, the most successful sides have had some longevity together, but it's got, um, I say it's got stability and it's got consistency. And I think along with that, players are different now um, and they want psychological safety. So they want the security of knowing what's coming. And I think we as a rugby fraternity, we can look or we can take care of that psychological safety by also looking at their transition post-rugby. Because if I'm a player at 24, 25, and I'm not sure what the future looks like post-30, that, that can create an angst in players. And if we as a rugby organisation can remove that by putting in what you're talking about, world after sport, putting in stepping stones or putting in a process that can look after that, that creates psychological safety for players. And I think that will get success on the, on the rugby field. The, the one thing I find really interesting from Coombsy was as a business, I've seen it as the clubs having to invest in the players' future, in their education and, and their transition. But as he says, why should you? Why should a club invest in somebody that they're not going to get the direct benefits from? Now, hopefully you get a performance benefit in the rugby side, but um, any other business wouldn't invest for somebody um, to upskill themselves to go to, go to a different business. Um, you know, and we're talking about who finances, who invests in this program. It shouldn't be for free. Is there a school of thought of having, having some sort of levy on salaries that has to be put aside for education, courses, development um, in the future? Interesting, really interesting, Carl. Thank you. Guys, I'm conscious of time. Um, so what I'm going to do is say if we can just stop at that point, um, I'd like to go around the room and just get your sound bites from you, if I may. Um, ultimately, it's just a very short, what have you taken from today's session? Personally, I've taken a heck of a lot and, it, and wrapping that up in a few seconds is going to be tough. But for me, there's probably two things. One, it's your own responsibility to think about your future um, and realise the importance of your future um, after sport. And two, is that personal development is a big part of that. Um, and the transferable skills that we take away from ourselves. So they're mine. Um, Phil, if I can come to you, what were your what are your thoughts of today from a sound bites? You on site secrecy, just so you know. Sorry, yeah, just it's been a you know fantastic conversation and thank everybody for for contributing. It's been you know it's been extremely insightful and 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 you know. Lots of learnings come out there for me, I must say. But it's just, again, it's about planning, you know, planning, uh, you know, for the next, well, planning during your playing or coaching career, if you like, for, for your next transition, whatever that might be, you know, and getting to understand yourself a little bit better. Self-awareness or development of self-awareness is important. So planning and self-awareness really for me. Brilliant. Thank you. Andrew, what's your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, guys. I actually really enjoyed today. It's been really beneficial for me personally. Um, I try to look at it. Uh, what can I learn to adopt into my business? And certainly, I think the uh, the IDP is a big thing for me. Being a, a director of the company and trying to help my staff grow. So I think that's something that I really need to do and put into my business. I've learned a lot of that today uh, from from everybody. Um, and just from Phil at the start, I can't believe I've never heard this term, but uh, play for the name on the front and not on the back. You know, I played rugby all my life and never heard that term. And again, that, that goes into my business. You know, the, my staff are walking around with my logo on their chest and um, I'd like them to adopt that policy as well. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Andre? I think just from my side, it's like we all are rugby players or we were rugby players at some point or managers. And I think we all have game plans. And it's just to be true to your game plan, which is basically you can 
put that under your core values or, or whatever you want. Um, I'm just like, stay true to your uh, game plan, execute, stay consistent, and then uh, always keep improving. Fantastic. Thank you. Alan, can I come to you? You're just on mute if you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, been great to be involved um, uh, with all the conversations and um, it's obviously similar messages coming across from everybody. I, I still can't believe there's not like a, a coaching association. Uh, there is probably a coaching association for coach development and experiencing and sharing coaching uh, stuff. But, uh, you know, personal development is, you know, I'm passionate about it. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Uh, it's no different to any other industry. Um, but I think it's like, it's about lifelong planning, um, not short-term planning. Uh, and that personal development is, uh, is vital. And I think the, the last little thing for me, you know, it's like, it's not about what you want, it's about what you need. I think we all want a Ferrari, but what you need is a good car to get from A to B. Uh, and A to B is a lifelong career development. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. Dylan. Uh, again, I just want to thank everyone because obviously being a, a young coach, hearing everyone else's experiences just fast tracks me a little bit more so I don't have to go through some of the, the hurt and some of the other experiences some of you guys might have already gone through. But um, Andrew's story really um, made me sort of think a little bit outside past that transition instead of a transition of an academy player coming into a pro footy, but also that transition out of it. And yeah, just made me really think about how important that period is, but also you know, like Alan said as well, it's you want to give these guys an opportunity to develop in that area, but you don't want to hold their hand the whole way. So it's more around, you know, clubs should have a, a structure in place to at least give them the option to at least enable them. So instead of holding their hand, just give them the opportunity to enable. So that really hit home for me. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Dylan. If I can pass to um, Uva said next, uh, Charlie. Hi guys, yeah, like Dylan, I just want to thank you all uh, as a young coach. It's great to hear some of the experiences that you've had. Uh, it's great learning for me. Uh, the thing that I've taken away that I can put into mind is, is being self-aware as to why I've been given the job that I've been given uh, and using my strengths day-to-day, uh, -day, but also to an extent being aware of the people that I'm managing and what makes them tick. So it's staying true to my core values, uh, as Andre said, but also being aware of what certain people need at certain times. Thank you, Charlie. Seb? Yeah, I think for, for me, the, the real key takeaway is, you know, trying to be really div, uh, deliberate, you know, in your development. And, you know, a number of people have touched on that. Um, and I think aligned with that is, is making sure that that process is authentic. Um, so I think Andre touched on that really well. You know, there, there can be a, a lot of pressure to, to conform to a single pathway or a single method or, you know, as a coach, a style of coaching. And I think no matter whether you're developing as a player, as a coach, or, you know, in, in the business forum, you know, make sure your, your development is deliberate and, and make sure it's authentic to, to your values and, and what you stand for. Fantastic. Thank you. Can I come to um, Tim and then I'm, okay, I'm going to get you ready. Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm now coaching in business, not in sport, but I've still got so much to learn from the sports network that I'm with today. And I think that's both on a personal development point of view, but also how that can then apply into to me being successful as a better coach or running better businesses. So there's so much value in this network and in the alumni that so creating this personal development network for coaches and to people beyond the game, it could be so, so valuable. Brilliant. Hoggy? Yeah, I just think the education um, of players and staff of the need to get personal development courses. I think at the moment, uh, players certainly, um, they, they end up just waiting, waiting till the end of their careers, but trying to educate them of the need to get personal development, not just players, but staff. I, I think that's absolutely crit critical. Fantastic. Thank you. Andre, I can't remember whether I came to you, so I'm just going to quickly ask. No, you already asked me. I said, uh, just stay too, true to yourself and your that gameplay. Forgive me. A, Forgive me. No worries. It's age. Don't worry. <laughs> too many names, too many pieces. So, Phil, I think you're going to wrap up for me on that one. So, what's your thoughts, um, just to, to finalise? What about Longy? Oh, Longy. Sorry, Sean. I'm right in the middle. Oh, I'm geez, around he, you. you got cock blocked again. <laughs> Sean, over to you. 
Make it good, uh, no pressure. Uh, to, to be fair, fellas, honestly, I've listened to every single one of you. I've learned so much of every single uh, person today. Um, um, I, like I said, my, my journey is, is starting at the bottom of the pile now in, U, in uni. So I, I've, I've got to learn. Um, I like what Tim said about understanding yourself and uh, investing in, in myself as a coach. Um, but my baby behaviors as a, as a as a coach and as a player, um, and then just just what what we spoke about before about treating people differently. You know, some people might need an arm around them. Some people might need less info. Some people might need more info. Uh, some people might be a straight shooter. So just understanding myself and understanding the players. Uh, who I'm coaching, I, I've learned a lot so much. Thanks, thank you very much. Brilliant, thanks, Sean. Really appreciate it, and great to have you on. Look, hopefully, you can join us again. Um, so, Phil, is there anything you wanted to say before I close the call? You want to mute, mate? Yeah, just again, just you know, thank everybody. It's been really interesting listening to all the different you know experiences and. And the sharing of knowledge and you know uh, from those experiences has been great. So just thank you very much, guys. And you know if there are if there is opportunity to put you know stuff out on social media in respect of you know what you've taken out of the calls, uh, what you've taken out of the calls we've just been discussing, that'd be fantastic. But thanks again. Stay safe. Okay, brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Phil. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, for those in Australia, wish you a good evening. For those in the UK. Um, wish you a good rest of the day. Enjoy the sunshine and stay safe, as Phil said. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, boys. Cheers. Thank you.